continuous investment and investment trade between Egypt and the UK. We're all looking forward to the leaders, the business society, the civil society who are attending COP to find solutions for the danger that is facing our planet. Uh, it is up to us, including UK and Egyptian companies, to play the role in reaching a circular economy with higher efficiencies and reduce waste. We're happy to bring together Egyptian and UK companies to cooperate together, foster cooperation, and work together for the road to recovery on a sustainable greener economy, and hopefully a brighter future for our children. Um, a lot of topics will be discussed in the uh, forum. I'd like to thank our sponsors who've sponsored uh, this uh, forum, uh, Standard Chartered, Vodafone, Capricorn, Likila, Egypt, Petrofac, the UK Export Finance, and uh, ACCA, DAR, the Knowledge Hub, Universities, and Miss Insurance Holding. I'd like to, to give the word uh, to uh, Ian Gray, who is chairman of uh, EBCC, and uh, to also introduce Her Excellency, Dr. Hala Saeed, Minister of Planning and Economic Development, whom I'd like to give a personal thank for her support and for her attendance. And I'd like also to welcome uh, His Excellency Gareth Bailey, the British ambassador to Egypt. So uh, Ian, please. Khaled, thank you very much indeed. And can I actually say on behalf of the Egyptian British Chamber of Commerce, a very big thanks, not just to Khaled, but to his team of Nadia, Engie, and all the others, because um, both the Chamber and Biba have worked superbly well together in trying to organize this. Um, I think we've got another bus coming with um, a load more people, but we're going to crack on, um, if we may. Um, our, our part as um, the, the, the Joint Chamber and Biba at COP27 um, is unashamedly focused on business-related issues. Um, we've got a session later today on group fi uh, green finance, um, looking for attitude changes to hit the climate targets. And tomorrow, we're opening with how both big and small businesses um, can actually deliver and benefit um, from supporting and contributing to sustainability. Um, from small companies, we have, um, you know, small company which develops disruptive, innovative technology. Who actually they, they identify the size and precise location of water leaks, which is all about reducing the need for um, generating water, um, and that's exciting. And later in the second session tomorrow, we're talking about decarbonisation, where Agreco will be talking about actually using, and if I've got to check my words here, a flare gas plant where they have just built the largest in Africa here in Egypt. And again, reusing um, uh, things. But look, I'm, I'm not going to say any more because um, I'm sure that everyone in the room has come here not to hear Khaled and I, but to hear the minister and the ambassador say something. So um, I, I was actually going to put in a pitch about how business can be supportive and can be partners. And my, my request of governments, um, both governments would be to recognize the challenges that businesses face with competitive pressures, with the need for long-term planning to be able to go forward to develop new ideas and to invest for the future. Um, so I, I think we can't ask governments for money, but all we can ask for is an understanding and in the hope of, I think in terms of, we want a sustainable environment. Can we have a sustainable economic environment to allow businesses to make the right decisions? We can't ask for anything, but I think the request to governments was, please don't make it worse. Um, so if, if I may, I'd like to hand over to the Minister for Planning and Economic Development here in Egypt, um, Dr. Her Excellency, Dr. Hala Saeed. That's, that's much better. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, everyone, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first, at the outset, I'd like to welcome you all to the COP27 
in our green city of peace in Sharm el Sheikh. It's a great pleasure to be among you all today in this distinguished multi stakeholder session surrounding such a pivotal subject. And allow me to take this opportunity to start by thanking uh, the BIBA, British Egyptian uh, Business Association, and the British Chamber of Commerce for inviting me to talk in this session. Actually, the Ministry of Planning and Economic Development and the government of Egypt uh, um, and your esteemed organization have had a long standing relationship, which uh, has borne a multitude of fruitful uh, outcomes and fruitful cooperation. Uh, as we embark on a journey of almost two weeks of negotiations, countless sessions, and a wide array of collaborations, we have in this session a unique opportunity to continue together to advance the vital subject of climate finance and foster communication between all partners in order to create investment opportunities in support of the global priority issues. The decade of action is now, and so now more than ever, action-oriented, implemented, based achievements are needed in this stage. And this is actually the slogan of this COP27, and according to a climate policy initiative based on estimate, climate finance must increase at least around 600%. The recent estimates say that developing countries need about 250 million billion US dollars annually up till 2030 in order to achieve only adaptation. So we're talking about from this up till 2030, we're talking about almost 2.5 trillion US dollar is needed to fill the gap only of adaptation for developing countries. And so to achieve real economic impact, we need better oversight to ensure that commitments are immediate, credible, and really verifiable. Allow me in this respect to underscore the importance of the Egyptian government to form a partnership and attracting increasing number of businesses, large and small, to demonstrate their solution in advancing climate actions. And I believe this is a vital purpose of this forum as it provides a much needed space for an open dialogue between representatives of the government, the private sector, and the international development community. In light of all what has been mentioned by <laughs> Yan, let me share with you some of the key policies that the government of Egypt has taken to support, facilitate for the business community. So first, Egypt moved forward with the Head Start by applying for the first time, we have environmental sustainability guidelines for the public investment. And I would like to take this opportunity to share with you, I'll share with the British Egyptian uh, uh, Association and the Chamber of Commerce, these guidelines, because we want to adopt these guidelines and make them the national guidelines. So we're open for amendments, suggestion, recommendation, in order to embed and adopt these guidelines for the all projects in Egypt. Secondly, we have currently a national investment in green projects around account in our public investment plan that I am uh, uh, proudly responsible for. We reached 40%, basically in transportation, in uh, uh, um, uh, electric vehicles, in uh, water desalination. So we reached this year, we're about 40% of our investment projects are green, and we target to reach 50% by the year 24-25. In tandem with criteria implementation, uh, last May, Egypt launched a climate strategy, as you know, that recognized a more systematic and strategic integration of climate change into government activities. It aimed to foster innovative financing mechanisms that prioritize adaptation measures, such as green bonds, in addition to enhancing private sector participation in climate finance and promoting jobs. Egypt also, one of the Egyptian uh, private sector banks, launched green bonds with a value of $750 million to mobilize resources for green projects, especially in the field of clean mobility. And additionally, we have launched our structural reform agenda. And let me here talk about our structural reform agenda because Egypt, for the first time, launched or embarked on a structural reform plan. As you know, we had different structural uh, we had different reform uh, plans, but it usually focused on the fiscal and the monetary side of the economy. We never looked at the structural, the structural imbalances in the Egyptian economy. So the growth goes up, and then when we 
are hit by an external shock, the growth goes down again. So what we thought about, and as a Ministry of Planning and Economic Development, and one of our main mandate is to suggest and recommend economic reform policies for the government and for the Economic Committee. So we came out and through public discussion and public consultation with the private sector and civil society, we came out with the structural reform agenda. It is based on four main pillars. The first pillar is focusing on the real side of the economy. The real side of the economy is the manufacturing, ICT, and agriculture. This will make the economy more resilient, will make the economy more competitive, will make the economy more focused on export and the competitiveness of our exports, because our exports will not be competitive if they are basically do not have the technological component. If we have to increase the technological component to 30% of our exports in order to make our exports more competitive. So focusing on the real side of the economy for the first time, our the three sectors basically comprise about 26% of our growth. We need to reach 35% of our growth in order to make the economy more resilient. The second pillar is enhancing the role of the private sector. And in this respect, we came out and with uh, uh, our partners, and I say our partners, the uh, um, SUS Economic Zone and the uh, General Authority for Investment for uh, Investment to activate some of the articles that were not activated in the investment law. We had a lot of articles to incentivize the private sector that were not activated. So we activated these incentives and we added some other incentives for green localization. And we're also open for any recommendation to help business in Egypt flourish and uh, uh, to be sustainable. The other thing, we amended the pri private public partnership law because during the past years, during the past 12 or 14 years, we discovered that a lot of hurdles. The process was not easy. The process was a lot, uh, very complex. So we came out with a, a simple process whereby we, as a Ministry of Planning, we receive all the investment projects. So we start discussing what are the projects to go in the pipeline in the public-private partnership uh, uh, line, and we start facilitating this process with the private sector. The third thing is that we establish the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Egypt which I proudly chair, and this sovereign fund of Egypt, its main role is to crowd in private sector. It looks into different investment opportunities, it transfers these investment opportunities into investment products, and it offers this in, uh, uh, to the private sector through a de-risking, because I know that we may face a lot of bureaucracy with the government, so it does a lot of de-risking, through facilitating the process with the private sector. We have a lot of projects that we crowded in private sector. We had five sub funds today. One of them is focused on utilities and infrastructure. We just uh, launched yesterday the first project on green hydrogen in partnership with the private sector, uh, uh, with Oraskom, with Fertiglobe, and with Skatec uh, as one of the Norwegian uh, uh, companies, and it was launched physically at Aina Sochna yesterday at the Suez Canal Economic Zone. We have also a pipeline of uh, green hydrogen projects that will sign the framework agreement uh, on the energy day. Uh, we have also, uh, we have uh, issued a bid on the water desalination. We received 300 offers from 30 countries. So this means that there is a great appetite. And what we are saying that this is the role we are moving, the government has spent it exceptionally the past few years because we were, uh, during the period from 2011 to 2014, the, the, this period, the, the country suffered from insecurity and instability. So when the, the state was stabilized, we started investing a lot in infrastructure to upgrade the level of the deteriorating infrastructure. And now it's the time for the government and the state to step and exit this, and we need to optimize this investment infrastructure. We invested around 400 billion US dollars in infrastructure, in energy, in electricity, in roads, in ports, and no private sector would have come to a country that had electricity cuts. No private sector would come to a country that does not have a, a, a port network, a road net, a proper road network, a public, good public transportation in order to offer good quality 
of life for our people. So we had to invest in this and nobody had the amount of investment and the quick investment except the state at that time. And this is the time now for the state to exit this investment. And that's why the Sovereign Wealth Fund is working with sovereign wealth funds, with private sector, with foreign uh, uh, investors in order to crowd in the private sector in this type of investment. And this, the, the, the offers we received on the water desalination is just an example of the appetite that foreign investment, this uh, investment, these offers came from 30 different countries, Arab and international countries. So this shows the great appetite. This in addition to different uh, uh, use of unutilized assets that we receive, like uh, uh, pieces of land that we offer to the private sector to make schools. We had different six schools in partnership with the private sector. We had also uh, technical schools uh, that we offer them the land. We enter with a minority just to comfort the private sector. So it's part of the dearest thing that we do with the private sector. And the last uh, um, sub fund that we have established is the pre-IPO fund, where we take stakes we transfer uh, some of the uh, stakes of the public companies to the fund, and we offer this as sort of a private placement or to strategic investors. So uh, the Egyptian Sovereign Wealth Fund has been working diligently to crowd in private sector investment, as I said, in renewable energy, green hydrogen, green ammonia, water desalination, among other uh, pro promising sectors. We realize that Egypt's ambition to become a green energy hub will require significant investment from the private sector, and uh, this is why we take this seriously, and we establish uh, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Egypt as a trust worthy and reliable partner for the private sector. Uh, uh, the third uh, pillar is basically the, um, the third pillar of the structural reform agenda is basically uh, safety and uh, um, um, safety uh, safety protection uh, for uh, uh, the less privileged people. You know, we're a populous uh, country, so we needed to offer uh, uh, a sort of uh, uh, safety to uh, the uh, less privileged people of the country, uh, but also we are we have a demographic dividend. Thirty percent, sixty percent of our population are under the age of thirty-five. So we have the presidential initiative Haya Karima that basically targets the multi-dimensional poverty, because safety and stability of the country we need a sort of uh, protection. And we need sort of uh, this type of protection uh, for our uh, uh, less privileged people. So Haya Karima Decent Life Initiative basically targets the less, less privileged uh, uh, um, part of our community through basically we are targeting the 17 uh, SDGs through different uh, uh, access to better services in water, uh, sanitation, uh, um, electricity, uh, housing, decent housing, medical, uh, and of course, uh, uh, education. So uh, uh, this is also one of the biggest developmental projects uh, worldwide, in addition to the family development uh, project that uh, we thought that it's one of the very important projects to align with Haya Karima. This project basically works on two dimensions. The first one is uh, um, birth control because we increase by 2.5 million people every year. That's a big burden on development, yet we need to capitalize on the demographic dividend and on the female uh, and the women economic empowerment. So uh, uh, that's why for the first time we are targeting the population issue from a developmental perspective. We are working on incentivizing uh, the uh, society on the birth control, yet we are, the main aim is investing in our people. So that for the first time, we have four pillars for this family development program. And the main pillar is women economic empowerment. And also here we tap on the support of the business community. We are targeting to uh, train and employ 1 million female every year. And this is uh, open, this is done through support of the this is not the work of the government, this is the work of the private sector and the civil society 
at the local level. So we're working also with a lot of partners on this initiative. And for the first time, we're offering the female who will abide by uh, um, uh, number of children, taking care, following up on the medical checkups, following up on her uh, children to go to school and on the vaccination and everything. We are following up on this and the female that will abide with this will receive a deferred uh, saving scheme at the age of 45. So this is, we're working on the positive incentives for the first time, not the negative incentives. That's why our main aim is to invest in the characteristics of people and to invest in our population in addition to uh, the birth control. At the same time, uh, we have a presidential initiative at uh, the COP. The Decent Life, as I said, aims to uh, increase the quality of life of the rural people and it targets 58% of the Egyptian population. Uh, and uh, we are targeting uh, 4,500 villages and we are tapping and capitalizing on this initiative to uh, have a presidential initiative at the COP called Decent Life for Resilient Africa. And I invite you all, uh, this is going to be launched on the Adaptation and Agriculture Day, and we are uh, aiming to uh, uh, improve the quality of life of 30% of the most vulnerable and poorest villages at the rural areas in Africa by 2030 to in a climate resilient uh, 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 note. On, an, uh, on a more recent note, I'm also proud um, to announce the launch of the National Initiative for Green Smart Projects, which represents a sincere effort to face climate change in a holistic approach to achieve all SDGs. This initiative is part of the National Climate uh, Change Strategy 2050. It charts a map for each governorate and it helps in localization. I do believe as an economist that development happens at the root, at the bottom, at the local level, not from the top, not from the central government. If you, we need development, we need to work at the local level and at the rural and the villages. So this uh, initiative works on the localization uh, um, uh, of SDGs. It works on uh, each map. We need to have each chart, a map for each governorate, smart green projects, connecting them with funding agencies and attracting necessary investments while we also raise awareness with respect to climate change. And Vodafone is one of our main partners in the Smart Green Initiative. And I thank all partners for collaborating, for uh, 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 mapping and for uh, networking and uh, uh, accessing all young and uh, smart green projects with funding mechanisms and with support and capacity building. Finally, I'm sorry, I have back-to-back -back sessions today. So finally, uh, um, the time is to act. This requires emphasizing the importance of coordination, international and regional cooperation, networking among all relevant stakeholders, public sector, private sector, civil society, and development partners at the local and international level, where we must recognize the important roles they play and the vital contributions they provide in the path towards climate change mitigation and adaptation. I very much look forward to your fruitful discussion by the distinguished members of the British Egyptian uh, Association today on this extremely important and pressing topic. And I thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Minister, we know you have to rush, and I think we just want to say thank you so much for finding some time today. If I can maybe just pick one thing from what you said, as an economist saying that development starts at the roots, I think one of the other things that we will be emphasizing over the next couple of days is actually over 50% of the working population work in small companies. Those small companies actually are the roots in business for actually things coming through. And it's so easy for government to talk to the large companies and as Ben knows, I love Vodafone dearly. It, 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 it was a large part of my life. Um, but the small companies actually really matter. So thank you. Please, thank you. Uh, well, let me say that uh, we need countries in order to leapfrog. You need big companies. 
You need big companies that add to the technology and add to the competitiveness of the company. So we need big companies to transfer technology and capacity building. This is very much needed. But in order to achieve development and decent jobs, we need to work. So we cannot avoid both. We need to work on the small, medium, because we want them also as a feeding industries to the big companies. So the, the link and the network is very important. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry that I have to leave. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think we can all agree that that is a truly fine example of a minister. So, even though she's not here, I'm going to clap. <laughs> she's off on a, a hectic schedule. So, I'm the British ambassador to Egypt. My name is Gareth Bailey. And a uh, big thank you, firstly, to Khalid, to Ian, and welcome to Sarah and to Ben as they travel over to us. There's Anissa, uh, my director of trade, who's moving people into position. So we have a nice, full-looking panel. And um, I must say, it's before 10 a.m. And uh, certainly for ambassadors, that's well before breakfast. But I think we'll manage. Um, let me, uh, well, firstly, thank Vodafone and Standard Charter as our principal partners, but all the other sponsors. Let me. Let me surprise you. Let me surprise you, okay? Are you all ready for a surprise? The UK, by Egyptian numbers, is the largest foreign direct investor in Egypt. Not the Emirates, not Saudi Arabia, not China, not America, the UK. <laughs> Claps. And as, a, as an ambassador, because we love our flags, we love our little flags, we uh, ruthlessly take something like Vodafone and stick a British flag in it and we get very excited. But I'm not here to uh, inspire hard-nosed businessmen and women about flags and about countries. You're here to do business. And I'm going to therefore give you a second thing. And this is a confession. That large investment portfolio is not actually overall that modern. We have a huge hydrocarbon element to this. Most British investment is happening actually in the Mediterranean, in the Red Sea, sometimes on land, but perhaps not actually in the most modern way. So that's fact two. We have something which is very, very big, but not necessarily very, very modern. Now, there are exceptions in this second point. I'm looking at you, Baggett, looking at PwC, Vodafone here, Bupa, Unilever, GSK, HSBC, Actis, these are super, super modern firms, and they are thinking about how to render real that, that tenet by which we live in capitalism, which is creative destruction, by which we mean the dismantling of long-standing practices through innovation to come up with new solutions. So this is our second point that we've got this thing which is established and mature, and as the British ambassador to Egypt, particularly at COP, I have a mission with my trade team, with my economic team, to support the reimagination of the investment portfolio. To think, how is it that we make real what we say day in, day out, from my seat, the green partnership between Egypt and the UK. It is with all respect to our friends in the oil and gas industry, and there are a few here today, doing a really essential thing, keeping these lights on right now. But with all respect to them, the future, and they would say it themselves, is not in fossil fuels, but it is in renewables. So the third point for me today is that I have a mission 
to support the the established firms in the portfolio investment, but also the new firms. So company names like Likela, Globalec, these are not household names. This is not the Vodafone on the street. This is not BP and Shell. This is uh, a set of brand names who are absolutely cutting edge, but are not yet established as household names. So I have got a third mission, which is to support any name whether it be established or whether it be new, in pursuing this thing called green. My fourth point is about Egypt. A year and three months in, I am somewhat fatigued by hesitancy and caution on the part of foreign investors. I'm kind of getting bored of the story, which is, oh, Egypt, you know, pyramids, but not opportunities. We need to rethink what is going on here. We need to rethink at some pace, Hala Saeed and the entire government before COP, away from the world's eye, spent a strong and difficult week working through the whole economic reform agenda. And they did it uh, in plain sight, with full discussion, working through the really difficult issues that people have been talking about for years now, which is things like, what is the role of the private sector? What is the level playing field that we seek? What is going to happen with the Egyptian pound and will it be floated? Et cetera, et cetera, and so on and so forth. But there is something happening here. And the documents that have been promised for months, if not years, are now out in plain sight. And I will continue to maintain, particularly to British friends, that we have here an extraordinary opportunity in terms of the renewables agenda particularly. But let's just put the renewables agenda to the side. Look at the location of Egypt. It is extraordinarily well located. Look at the size of real estate that can be used for renewable energy in sun, in wind, in solar. Look at the way that Egypt is located in such a manner that it can be part of this thing called onshoring and friendshoring in a world where supply chains are vulnerable. And the question, particularly for incoming European investors, is are you going to have some of that? Or are you going to sit around complaining about it? Because there is, of course, any number of risks that any uh, diligent uh, CFO will be keenly aware of when we're looking at an investment decision. But, and this is particularly directed to the British uh, investor, it's really time to get into Egypt, I would say. And for the Egyptian investor, I would just recall that first number, the largest investor here for a reason. We have a spectrum of opportunities. And we have something which I want to ignite with my good friend Sharif Kamil in London over the next few years. I will not rest easy, my friends, if in three years' time I said, Malish, it was a fun trip. I saw a few pyramids. We did a bit of this, a bit of that. But ultimately, we didn't have a revolutionary change. And the warning, particularly to investors outside, is if you don't get in now, then you're going to be too late. Let's look at green hydrogen as an example. Green hydrogen, we've got 16, 17 firms running at pace on this green hydrogen issue. Now, I'm proud to say that British International Investment's in on this, GlobalX in on this, Actis is in on this, BII are actually in on the Arascom SCATEC deal. It's all there, but can we not double it? Can we not treble it? Because no other firm I'm seeing in the market is saying, well, let's see what happens in Abad, especially now that Russia, Ukraine has pushed super hard the incentive structure around renewables. So we've got the sun in Benban, we've got the wind in the Gulf of Suez, we've got the green hydrogen, all of that around the Suez Canal zone, and we have opportunity in spades. Final point, uh, and this is just to give you a few um, heads ups, uh, a few acronyms uh, that I want you all to, to really think about. I mentioned British International Investment, BII. That will become increasingly a household term for us. They used to be called the Commonwealth Development Corporation, and nobody knew what that was. No, frankly, nobody knew it was British. Nobody knew it was about money. They didn't really know what it was. So the brand has changed. It's called BII, and it has well over $600 million of investment, and it is fully government-backed. It's not half government-backed. It is our treasury-backed. So please, if you don't know Shireen Shahdi already at BII, know her. Have her on speed dial. 
she's a person to know. Uh, the other uh, thing is that we are a proud partner now of Nawefi. So uh, Egypt, not part of the Just Energy Transition Partnerships, decided to have one of its own, a typically Egyptian uh, response, if I may, to a policy challenge. They created Nawefi on their own. It was up last night. It was a massive event. All the big stars were there to talk about it. The nexus of water, food, and energy. I would commend to everybody here to get their head around Nawefi. We've put in about $7 million of direct grant aid for quick money to help prime bigger projects. Others have put in concessional financing. There is a serious amount of liquidity around that project. And then the third is just a really, it's a smaller project, but I'm happy and proud of it. And it's called the Climate Finance Accelerator. And that's where we use a little bit of finance to help, uh, to help particularly those looking for green finance to produce bankable projects, CFA. Climate Finance Accelerator. So I've got three means, British international investment, identifying Egypt as their number one powerhouse country around the world, NOEFI, which I think is a really strong looking program, which we're a proud partner of, and the Climate Finance Accelerator, which is particularly attractive to those of you who are involved in finance, financial services, and fintech. So there we have it. I will stop uh, with just a rallying call to everybody in this room to reimagine here in this amazing couple of weeks at COP what we could do between the UK and Egypt. Because if we don't do it now, my friends, I can assure you that others will do it instead of us. And I really don't want to be that person at the back of the pack. I'd like us to be at the front leading with confidence. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um it's always a risk when you speak on a panel, you don't quite know what the people before you're going to say. But I just one plug for BII. We've worked with BII in our most recent international expansion into Ethiopia, which we're very proud of. So I can just only echo the words you just heard that it's something to get behind. But um, first, just to say thank you to the, the organizers for this event, giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, also, pay tribute to the government of Egypt for putting on this amazing show. It's, it's too early to tell whether this will be a success or not. You know, there's lots of negotiation to come. But all I can say is I've enjoyed my short stay here and it's been a, an amazing organization of, of what is a truly global event. Now, the theme of today was the, the road to the green economy. Uh, it, it won't surprise you to know that coming from a company like Vodafone, we believe that the road to the green economy is the same road as the road to the digital economy. These two things need to go hand in hand. Um, so, OK, now I, now I hear myself. Um, yeah, so it won't, won't surprise people to know that the from our perspective, Vodafone, the road to the green economy is the road to the digital economy. We heard from the um, Secretary General of the United Nations on Monday that we're on a highway to climate hell and we've got our feet on the accelerator. A very strong words. And I think we now, it's incumbent on all of us to find that steering wheel, change course and get on that road to the green economy and the road to the digital economy. Because we know that companies that do invest in the, in the green economy make a higher return. There's evidence out there that actually 18% higher returns from those companies that really embrace um, the risks of climate and, and deal with it. And we know that the World Bank tells us $1 of investment in green um, initiatives yields a $4 return. So we need to find a way to ensure that these benefits really come to the fore. Um, but in saying that, we see some barriers to, to this road to the green economy, which I just like to address today, because despite the values that is evident for all, um, there, there are um, things that we we see stopping us and therefore there's three principles that we'd like to have a um, discussion on today um, which we need to bring into play the first is we need to shift our time horizons the second is we need to avoid fragmentation and the third is we need to export innovation from africa to europe something that we um, haven't really talked about a lot in the past but let me go through each of those in turn firstly in terms of shifting our time horizons there is a challenge we have to be open about it as businesses, we have a very short time horizon. Sometimes it is just one quarter. So if we're only thinking the next three months, how do we think about the next 10 years? And here it is really important that we're able to shift our time horizon. And it's interesting to hear the minister speak about the, the, the new sovereign wealth fund. It has to be partnership, public and private sector, where the different time horizons can be managed, the, the de-risking. These are initiatives which help the private sector, like where Vodafone obviously is a prime example, manage the tension between what we need to deliver for our shareholders in the short term versus what we need to deliver for the planet in the long term. And uh, in terms of long-term investment, I'll just put a plug in here. 
something we're very proud of. Yesterday, we signed the first, our first renewable energy deal with the Egyptian government, a one-year deal that allows our network to run 100% on renewable energy for the next year. Um, it's, for us, it's a, a short-term investment in terms of the energy life cycle, but it's, it's long-term for a business, and we know it's going to go on for years and years, and we're really proud of it being able to achieve this, and we hope it's just the starting point for long-term investment in renewable energy. And this is where we need all companies to step up and really think longer term, find these opportunities um, and, and really bring in the, the renewable energy, the green economy into the day to day running of the business. There's nothing more important for us than our network. Without our network, we can't provide anyone with the services that we're proud of. It's now 100 percent on renewable energy, something that we're doing all over Europe as well. The second part, which is really important, is, is the collaboration over fragmentation, because we know that climate change respects no boundaries in the same way that the digital society knows no boundaries. These are two things which travel seamlessly across borders, and therefore we need to have an international approach rather than a fragmented approach to this. And that here there's one example is where we can do much better collaborating internationally is on e-waste and circularity, because it's a, it's a, to be honest, it's a very embarrassing statistic, 17%. Only 17% of global e-waste is of, of, of e-waste is actually recycled. We can do so much better than this. We need to find cross-country initiatives to speed up the this, the recycling of of e-waste, because a lot of it today ends up in Africa, posing significant health risks. This is something we need to be much better on. But it's not just about managing the risk. This creates opportunities. If we are better with um, e-waste. We can find more jobs. We can actually accelerate the rollout of smartphones because of the, the rare materials. Um, and that's why, actually, in Egypt, we're working with the President's Go Green initiative. Um, to, and we've launched Itadwe. Itadwe, sorry, I won't get the pronunciation right. But Itadwe, I'm getting a thumbs up. Good. So, so again, another initiative we are doing in Egypt, we're proud of. It's important to speed up the e-waste the e um, recycling. And uh, again, working with government on that because it's not an issue as we can do by ourselves. And this is something we're also working with the ITU and the UN Broadband Commission um, to accelerate smartphone access to all because uh, the minister talked about the need to start at, at, the, at the base and really get an economic development for everyone. Something that when we met the UK foreign minister yesterday, he was very clear. He doesn't believe in trickle down economics. We need to work at the base. Smartphone in the pockets of every citizen unlocks a world of economic uh, opportunity. And we're working with the ITU, with the UN to really accelerate that availability of smartphones to every person everywhere where they are. And then the last principle, which I, I hope will be the most exciting to hear for people in the room, is the idea that we need to export innovation from Africa to Europe. You know, we, we, we might be, um, by reputation, a, a, a traditional British company that invests internationally and might think we take our, our European innovations and, and sell them to Africa. But actually, the things that I get most excited about are some of the innovations that we've seen coming from Africa, which we are now rolling out at scale across Europe. And we have a couple of examples. Asked, I'm, by the way, I, every time I'm in anywhere in the green zone, the blue zone, I'm completely lost. So I've got no idea where anything is. But in one of the directions that we have got a stand here in the, in the green zone, um, I invite everyone to come and look at our stand where we do have these innovations, um, African innovations, which we are, are sending to Europe. So let me just give you two examples. The first one is Connected Farmer. Um, it's, it's very simple, runs on basic um, connectivity. We rolled it out, especially in Kenya. Um, it gives farmers access to information, to finance, and better access actually to markets to sell their products. We're connecting over 2 million farmers, and it increases their productivity, increases their yield. They get information over various crop cycles. They get to learn. Um, and it, again, in, in, in the world today where, again, referring back to the Secretary General, we're going to have 8 billion people living on this planet. We need to do much more with what we have. And digital tools on farming really enhance the, um, the yield and therefore are able to deliver more with, with the scarce resources we have today. And then going back to the, the renewable energy theme, we have a, a really interesting innovation which we've rolled out in Kenya, um, where one of the challenges to renewable energy is if someone wants to put a solar panel on their, on their house, it's not cheap. And there's many people in the rural areas that simply cannot afford um, the, the upfront cost of, of the solar panel. Um, but yet we know the, the, the source of, of the supply is abundant and they're often not on the traditional grid. So with a piece of smart connectivity, what we do is we put the solar panel that also has um, connectivity in it, which means if the, if the person doesn't repay to the provider of the finance, the electricity gets cut. Now this, this might sound a little bit brutal. Oh, you cut the electricity, they can't pay. But actually, 
it's the only way you get the device on the house in the first place because those companies, it's not just us, who are rolling out the, the solar panels. They can't take the investment risk. They don't get the backing from the from finances to actually roll out this technology. You need to have the assurance that you have the control, that it's not just something that becomes a free product which is effectively stolen. And through this, we're able to assess creditworthiness and these, these devices do get paid back and we have rolled out hundreds and thousands of these devices across Africa. And we're now doing the same in Europe where we have an energy crisis and we know we need to expand our, our supply of energy, of renewable energy, wherever we are. So just two, two, two examples of African innovations that we've exported to Europe. And there is also one innovation where I'll, I'll refer to where we've come from Europe into Africa, into Egypt, into Sharm El Sheikh, where we are doing this, um, we're rolling out slowly using artificial intelligence to identify leaks in water pipes. Um, something we've, we've done in the UK, we're doing it here in Sharm El Sheikh, and I understand, I'm looking to my colleagues on my right, we'll be doing this across Egypt now. Again, water, we know is such a scarce resource, we cannot afford for it to leak through the pipes and not go to the end users. So using technology, using artificial intelligence, we can find the leaks, we can block the, block the leaks, and there's more water to supply for everyone. A UK, that's a UK innovation, you'll be pleased to know, um, coming from the UK to, to Egypt. And that's, again, the world of international collaboration. And it's, to be honest, why we believe Vodafone should exist. Uh, what, why should Vodafone exist across different markets? It's not because you need uh, the same network repeated multiple times. It's the digital innovations which solve societal problems, which we can innovate once and then roll out at scale, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in Africa, for the benefit of all society. That's what really gets us excited. And that's what we're showcasing um, at our stand in one of the four directions um, put around us. And so with that, <laughs> and so, yeah, with that, I will close and I will hand over to Sarah. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning. Um, firstly, apologies for my lateness. We had a half hour hike to get here. We got rather lost. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. My name is Sarah Howard and I am the proud chair of the British Chambers of Commerce. Our network spans across the UK and the globe with 53 chambers in the UK and 78 business associations and British chambers overseas, including our members here in Egypt. Thank you very much for the invitation. Last year, the Chamber Network ran a very successful climate challenge campaign to support COP26, which was held in Glasgow. Based on our experience there and our daily engagement with thousands of businesses, we know that addressing the climate challenge will require government, the economy and society pulling in one direction. Our research shows that uh, larger firms are more likely to have taken steps towards achieving the net zero transition than smaller firms. So it's vital that firms in every corner of the world are brought together on this journey through the power of partnership between public and private sectors. The minister's absolutely right. We have to work together on this. By representing our network at COP, the BCC hopes to continue working collaboratively with our international partners on finding solutions to our mutual challenge and ensure the innovation expertise of British businesses can play their part. Chambers of Commerce in the UK and internationally stand ready to exchange and share best practice between respective business companies, business companies, member companies, and support businesses in their local communities on the transition to net zero. This is particularly evident here at the work, with the work of the EBCC and other partners here in the forum. The British Chambers also plays a key role in enabling promoting business action on climate challenge in the UK, including through our in-depth research and insights delivering with our Chamber network. We have some of the richest insights into what businesses need in order to make the transition to net zero. We engage with government on a daily basis to help them understand which policy levers will make an impact and offer advice on how they can be deployed. Finally, we bring together an international network of chambers who are active in a diverse array of climate projects, including business advice, building supply chains for major renewable energy products and projects, and creating net zero innovation hubs. By learning from each other, we facilitate high impact actions to achieve the transition to green economy. We have a number of fantastic initiatives around our network in the UK and internationally, and there was some amazing work done uh, at COP we have now brilliant links made between Glasgow Chamber and Norway Chamber, for example, that are really sharing innovation between their countries. And then in the UK Chamber, we have Miranda Barker here today. Put your hands up, Miranda. 
Um, her initiative is internationally award-winning. So if you want to talk to her about all things green, please find Miranda later. Um, we are truly delighted to be here and to be part of the biz business forum and the wider programme at COP. We hope we can foster further cooperation and find mutual solutions to our society's biggest challenges. There is a strong desire from business across the world and of all sizes for more for to move forward towards a greener economy. And we are working with government and throughout the network to achieve this. So much was achieved last year at COP26. I look forward to seeing how we can build further here in Egypt today. Thank you very much. Sarah, thank you. Um, look, we, um, we're going to be heading into the next session. Caroline Ray, I think I saw Caroline earlier. Is Caroline around? So we're going to invite Caroline Ray in a moment to come up and get the, the panel going for the next session. But I think we can probably take a couple of questions very quickly. Um, uh, for, for, um, is there any for anyone in the room got questions for the current panel? If there's not, then I think I, it, it, would, it would fall to me. I, 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 well, I, no, we, 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 we have, we have a question. <clears throat> I, 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 okay. Now, clearly, in the absence of question, the, the unwritten question is: Is there something extra you would like to say, Ambassador? <laughs> it's not that. Um, no, it really isn't that. I think it's only. If I were in the audience at this time in the morning, in this extraordinarily dispersed festival of climate, I might be partially thinking, kind of, where's my next event? How do I get from here to Ben's amazing Vodafone stall and so on? But partly there may yet be an elephant in the room question, like an observation. This is a A-grade set of participants. I can see Miles over there, for example, I got it. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've flushed one out because we need to we need to ask ourselves the question, which is unaskable in a safe space. You're going to or make a make an observation. And I'm going to bring the microphone all the way down. No problem. Thank you. Alistair Monroe from Rise Energy. How does the panel see the conflict between uh, the manufacturing of goods in Europe and the localization of manufacturing in a country such as Egypt? which has all the natural resources, including human resources, but doesn't have that technology uh, within the country. And of course, you've then got the reverse issue of, does Europe accept the reverse supply of products? You know, we have a growing population here, two and a half million a year, more than a hundred million in the UK because of our own decisions, we've got uh, workforce shortages. But, you know, when you're looking at exporting products as we do to Egypt, you're creating jobs in your home country, but you're taking value from the country you're supplying to. There is, there is a conflict and a balance that's in that equation. So how does the panel see that? Well, it was my fault for asking, prompting the difficult question, but it's a really good difficult question. And I'll give you an example uh, exactly in this space, which is the monorail. So there's this monorail and the new administrative capital. The carriages for the monorail are built uh, in Derby. Um, it was Bombardier, then it became Ulstom. But the point is that the trains themselves are built in Derby. And that means there are many, many skilled jobs working on those trains. Now, it's been made clear uh, by Egypt to the entire world that it would like to build those trains here, or at least those trains descendants. And so you have a very delicate question, which I won't go into any further because we're into commercial confidence, but you know, how do you respond to that? And I know that there is a general uh, Department of International Trade uh, policy mandate to think through before it promotes an outward investment opportunity or, or some sort of deal, is there some kind of loss to, uh, to, to UK jobs? Uh, is there some sort of transfer of technology that we would rather hold on to because it gives us return on, on our investment and our intellectual capital going forward? My expertise runs out there uh, at the, the end of the monorail tracks, uh, but I just would agree with you 
there is clearly a tension here. And as I um, as I go around it promoting to British investors and exporters the the Egyptian story, which of course Sharif Kamal does himself out of London, um, I also have a mandate to think in the, the other direction. But looking forward, I guess these are the risks that we may have to take that ultimately there are firms in Egypt that say that they can supply componentry within our manufacturing at a competitive price point, which keeps our manufacturing base going. There are uh, particular firms here who say we can put wiring looms and types of tech into your heavy industry. If you don't accept that offer, then ultimately your products over time will become uncompetitive. So you need to think about modifying the supply chain. Anissa? Hi, uh, great question. Um, so it's my job um, to think this through. Um, and I'm very clear that my goal here in Egypt is for mutual economic growth. That is mutual economic growth for both the UK and Egypt. Now, where we help UK companies export, I believe they are adding value to Egypt because Egypt doesn't currently have the expertise. It will do, we hope, and we're partnering to Egypt, but there are technologies that exist in the UK and Germany that Egypt doesn't currently have in renewable energy, in healthcare, in education. So it's, it's a partnership. So with the monorail, for example, yes, it's creating jobs in the UK, but it's helping with Egypt's green transportation ambition. Um, so we're helping with Egypt's climate change goals or its public transportation goals, even if we're not helping in your manufacturing yet. But inshallah, if you must stop, shukran. Again, it maybe give a, a private sector response to that question. I think it's a great question. Look, we, we, we know we're living in a world of enhanced geopolitical tensions here, and there can be a knee-jerk reaction, use the word localization, to do everything local. But that, that's not our, our vision of the world as we go forward. Yes, there are challenges on the globalization agenda, but that doesn't mean we go to pure localization, everything built in one country, because then we'll be going hugely backwards in terms of the economic and social development that we've seen for, for many decades. So our, our, our sort of vision of localization would be that every country needs to find its local superpower. And every, every country needs to use that within a context of global supply chains to ensure that its place within that global supply chain is solid and secure and is not a take of every technology, not a take of every product, every innovation, but it can play its role and therefore have its seat at the negotiation table. That's how we think about localization. It's not something we say everything has to be made in Egypt, made in the UK, made in Germany. No, we work in, in global supply chains, but every country needs to work out what it, it contributes. And that's when, when we expand internationally, that's what's so important for us. I, just, I refer to our expansion into Ethiopia recently. This is not a UK company going to Ethiopia, sending UK people on the ground and running a business. No, we go there, we, we export our know-how, we employ local people, it's part of the development cycle, hundreds of new jobs created in Ethiopia as a result of this investment, and it will allow the Ethiopian people to step up on this global supply chain, have their own superpower they can contribute, and marry, marry the combination of local and international to create further resilience in society, further economic growth in society, but do it in a balanced way and not go to the knee jerk. It has to be everything local means everything built, sourced and made here. Just very quickly, because we're getting the wind up sign now. Um, I think just my, my comment would be that supply chain isn't just about goods, it's about skills. We have a lot of skills in the UK to export and to trade. And also chambers are all about trading. It's not all one way, it has to be two way. And that's what we're interested in, building on, on trade. Thank you. Sarah, thank you. Ambassador, thank you. Ben, thank you. If, if I could just add on, on, the, on that last one, I mean, thank you for the question. I think um, I, I, if you're Egyptian, you've probably heard of the company BTM. Um, if, you, if you're British, you may well have worn a suit made by BTM. You don't, you don't hear much about it. But the exports, and you know, the highest market share of OEM suits in the UK comes, comes from Egypt. Um, Egyptian cotton was very famous, producing a lot of things. And for some time, Egyptian cotton started to be substandard, 
not because the cotton was substandard, but because some dirt was getting into the cotton um, um, uh, coming on. Technology came over, assistance came over. And if I may, Ben, picking up on one of yours, the, the, and, and the point that Sarah's making about export of skills, from a Vodafone point of view, in terms of Vodafone came into Egypt just over 20 years ago or so, you know, who runs Vodafone in the UK today? Not the group, but Vodafone in the UK. Hey, guess what? It's Ahmed. He's Egyptian. He was the CEO here at one point. Who runs Vodafone commercial department worldwide? Guess what? He used to be the CEO in Vodafone Egypt. Now, I'm going to mention one that you won't like because another CEO of Vodafone Egypt went off to join Etisalat. He's now the group CEO. And Etisalat has now got a larger market cap worldwide than, than, than Vodafone. But, you know, Hatem, who went off to run, run Etisalat, came from, from Vodafone. So that skill transfer from, from the UK into Egypt has trained people who have come through. And I think from, from my own point of view, I, I, I've, I've been in the work environment for quite a long time now. I have never had a better workforce than I had working in Egypt. It was the most talented and committed bunch of there's a no, don't clap you're one of them you're not allowed to okay that's cheating but it but it but it happens to be true look if you'll forgive me I, look there, there, there's a tight schedule all the way through but i want to thank the panel yet again for this was meant to be introductory remarks we ended up with a really good panel discussion ambassador ben sarah thank you all very much thanks all of you for being here and um, we're going to move on now, and I'm going to ask Caroline to come up and assemble her panel for our next um, session. Thank you all very much.